Daily Bible Time. Good morning, it is Dominic Steele, and uh, thanks for joining us. We're doing 66 chapters in 60 days, looking at the book of Isaiah. We're at Isaiah chapter 5, and uh, a change in gear. Um, in chapter 4, focused on heaven and the glory of God, and then we get to chapter 5, and the heading in the uh, CSV is um, Worthless Vineyard. And we are back on the theme of judgment and disappointment. And it is really from the heights down to the depths. And uh, the commentator Barry Webb suggests that the prophet Isaiah is aiming to get a hearing for his unpleasant message. And so he presents himself as a minstrel and beguiles his unsuspecting audience with song. So he says, chapter 5, verse 1, I will sing about the one I love, a song about my loved one's vineyard. Uh, the one I love had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He broke up the soil, cleared it of stones, planted it with the finest vines. He built a tower in the middle of it and even dug out a wine press there. He expected it to yield good grapes, but it yielded worthless grapes. And uh, now in the metaphor, the one's beloved um, is the Lord and the vineyard is Judah, Israel. And the Lord has extended lots of patient care on his vineyard, but it has only produced wild, worthless grapes. So now, residents of Jerusalem, verse 3, and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. Verse 4, what more could I have done for my vineyard than I did? Why then, I expected a yield of good grapes. Did it yield worthless grapes? Now I'll tell you what I'm about to do to my vineyard. I'll remove its hedge and it'll be consumed. I'll tear down its wall and it'll be trampled. Now, the Lord would have been fully justified in removing the protective wall of the vineyard and abandoning it. Verse 6, I'll make it a wasteland. It will not be pruned or weeded. Thorns and briars will grow up. I'll also give orders to the clouds that rain should not fall on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel and the men of Judah. The plant he delighted in. Now look at the last line. He expected justice, but saw injustice. He expected righteousness, but heard cries of despair. Now, Barry Webb points out the demand for social justice. That's a basic covenant obligation. And this demand is succinctly and forcefully presented here. And so we come to judgment. And there are six woes from verse 8 onwards. Um, and they're spelling out the bad fruit that is described in verses 2 through 4 first greedy land grabbing. Um, woe to those who add house to house and join field to field until there's no more room and you alone are left in the land. Verse 9, I heard the Lord of armies say, indeed many houses will become desolate, grand and lovely ones without inhabitants. For a ten acre vineyard will yield only six gallons of wine and ten bushels of seed will yield only one bushel of grain. Second woe is for debauchery. Woe to those who rise early in the morning in the pursuit of beer, who linger into the evening inflamed by wine. At their feasts they have lyre, harp, tambourine, flute and wine. They do not perceive the Lord's actions. They do not see the work of his hands. Um, it's just debauchery. We get to the third woe, verse 18. Woe to those who drag iniquity with cords of deceit and pull sin, sin along with cart ropes. To those who say, let him hurry up and do his work quickly so that we can see it. Let the plan of the Holy One of Israel take place so we can know it. There's an arrogant defiance of God. Fourth woe is for what Barry Webb calls justifying sophistry. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who consider themselves wise and judge themselves clever. Now, I'm just going to pause on this one. Why do those who call evil good and good evil? Verse 20. Um, it is really clear that in our era, this is a challenge. For on issues of sexuality, there are a lot of people today who are looking at what God has called good and what God has called evil. And there is a woe here to those who would change the teaching of God, who would mislabel the teaching of God. And... It is a concern in the Australian Church, in the Australian Anglican Church, that the Anglican Archbishop of Perth has been prepared to ordain a man to holy orders who had children out of wedlock and only married his wife just a couple of months before the ordination service. A further concern is the Archbishop of Perth was prepared to ordain to holy orders somebody uh, living, a man living in a civil partnership with another man. 
And so I read this verse, Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe to the Anglican Archbishop of Perth. And there's been a similar problem in the Anglican Church in Albury Wodonga, where a minister has blessed a same-sex union. And, um, and so we have a challenge to the rest of the Australian Anglican Church. We've got a moment where what's the rest of the church going to say to the Perch Arch Arch Archbishop? What's the rest of the church going to say to the minister in Albury? Will the rest of the church join those ministers in their sophistry? This is a sobering word in Isaiah 5. And my prayer is that the church would return to God, take seriously the warnings through all of Isaiah, and that actually those who don't listen to God would be judged. Heavenly Father, we pray that we would take seriously this warning of judgment in all the different areas of chapter 5, um, that we would hear the words of this song, that we would look at ourselves and think, are we guilty of greedy land grabbing if we are repent of drunken debauchery? We pray that we might repent of that. We pray we might repent of arrogant defiance. We pray we might repent of justifying sophistry. We pray we would not call good what God calls evil.